Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Super excited to be joining everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. I've got some really awesome guests, but while everyone is trickling in here, there's a couple housekeeping items I want to cover. This webinar, of course, as all of our webinars are, is going to be recorded and be sent out to everyone who registered. Please use the chat. This is a workshop, so if you have any questions, please use the chat. We're going to try to get to as many of those questions as possible. And if you would like to learn a little bit more about Lead IQ, where I work, visit leadiq.com. We also have some really awesome previous webinars, as well as blogs and other resources for you all to check out. So go visit our website. And some of the recent topics we've recently covered is intent data, the role of the AE and SDR and how it's changing. Email deliverability and AI, of course, has been a hot topic. So what we're going to be focusing on today is this is going to be a cold, cold outreach workshop where we're going to be looking at some pitches, breaking them down, giving some feedback, and then actually rewriting them and showing you where we're doing our research and how we do our research to craft the perfect message. Before we jump in, I really quickly want to pose a kind of a hot take with a poll here. How long do you typically spend researching a prospect before your initial outreach? Really interested to see what comes through here. So the options are less than one minute, I'm in less than three minutes, three to 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, over 20 minutes. So looking like three to 10 minutes is taking the cake here. That's really interesting. It looks like most folks are spending three to 10 minutes on research. So really interested to get our guests take on cold outreach. So I'm going to introduce, start introducing our guests here. We'll have them introduce themselves. So I want to start off by welcoming Zach Anderson. Zach, would you take a second to introduce yourself to the folks that are attending here today? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sean, first off, thanks for inviting me here. As the floaty uh, Zoom head says, name Zach Anderson. I'm coming over here from Memorial Health. I lead our strategic accounts market, which uh, really excited to dive in more and see what y'all are pitching and see how we can uh, fine tune some of these messages. Now, quick note about Memoria, we uh, digitize and automate care journeys for health systems, health plans, as well as retail health and digital health. Really excited to show you how I uh, break those things apart and really make sure that my message is relevant and targeted towards who I'm reaching out to. Again, uh, Sean, excited for this conversation with Danny and Jack. Awesome, Zach. Welcome, welcome. So excited to have you. Next, I'll introduce Danny. Danny, why don't you go ahead and uh, say hello to everyone attending here? Hi. Yeah, echoing Zach. Thanks so much for inviting me to come on. I am in Nashville, Tennessee. I work for Mountain. I lead our enterprise sales development team here. I've been over a multitude of different sales development teams um, in my career. And then specifically with Mountain, what we do is we bring um, advertising to connected TV. So we're the seventh largest TV ad uh, buyer. And um, what we're able to do is really offer an opportunity for people who have never been on TV before to be able to afford that. So excited to dive in, share some of the tips and tricks I've learned throughout my career, and then also learn from others on this call. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us here today, Danny. We're so lucky to have you. And last but certainly not least, we've got Mr. Jack Funk. Jack, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself? Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me here. I'm fired up to be just presenting alongside Danny and Zach. But my name is Jack Funk. I'm with Salesforce, been with Salesforce for going on four years now. And I started as an intern, did SDR, BDR all the way through. So I've done a lot of the cold outreach and all that stuff. And Obviously, Salesforce is the 800-pound gorilla in the CRM space, but we obviously do marketing, Slack, data visualization, integration. You run your whole business off of us. So if there's anything I can be doing to help, definitely let me know. But I'm fired up to be here alongside the rest of our panelists. Awesome. Welcome, welcome, Jack. So let's jump right into it. I've been really excited while we've been planning this webinar, right? There's a lot of content and resources out there that tell you how to create the perfect message, but no one really shows you how to do it. So I'm really excited to show the attendees how we think about cold outreach and dive into some of the techniques we use. So I want to really quickly pick the panel's brain 
on what they look for in cold emails and what they use to craft the perfect message to, uh, to resonate with their prospects. So who wants to go first? What is something that you think is like the most important aspect of a cold pitch? I can chime in first. I think personalization is key. I think the further that we've gotten into sales and specifically SaaS sales and seeing more companies pop up, the reality is that means your prospects are getting more emails. And so it's not just prospecting within your, the body of your email to then lead to your pitch, but really your subject line. If you're landing in the inbox with the same subject line, everyone else has, hey, quick question, quick connect, good to meet you. It doesn't really stand out in a kind of scream sales email at that point. So for me, personalization is something that I think should never be sacrificed when it comes to looking up your prospect and knowing when you're going to reach out to them. One of the things I love to, and I know we'll get into it a little bit more when we get into the pitches, but one of the things I really like to use on LinkedIn is the activity to understand what have people been posting, what have they been commenting on, and what have they been interacting with to be able to use that as a bridge in your outreach as well. That's awesome, Danny. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think that's so key. Your message has to show that prospect. It is meant for that specific prospect, right? There's just too much outreach happening right now. So if your email is generic, you're really not going to see the response rates that you want. Uh, Versus when you do put the time in to find something that's relevant to that specific prospect to personalize that outreach. Thank you for sharing, Danny. Jack, how about you? What do you think makes cold a great cold email? Yeah, I've got two thoughts that I definitely still use like every day in my day to day email outreach. Is one is definitely like a little bit of a pattern interrupt. And I know there's like the classic like pattern interrupts that people do, but I feel like always doing a would you be opposed to learning more like things like that where it's it's a lot harder to say no to that. And the second thing that's really important and me now, especially as a seller, what I'm doing outreach is like, you have to understand how the business you're reaching out to makes money. Like whether they've got an initiative that this is tied to, if they're trying to improve the way that they're going to market or the way that they're being efficient with their time. And if you're reaching out to someone that's in operations or strategy, like how do you help them like work on their bottom line. Because if you've got something that is relating to that, and generally all three of us here, like with what we sell and what we do, you're trying to tie something to that. And so as long as you know how that business makes money, whether they're selling direct, selling through a channel, all that stuff, and you're tying what you have to that, then it makes a lot more sense as opposed to just, hey, can I get, can I get on the phone with you to tell you about what we do? It's like, no, like, can I get on the phone and tell you about how I can save you money? Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's key. That's where a lot of, I feel like folks, when they first start their career off in sales development struggle is business acumen, right? Really understanding how you can impact the business with the solution that you, your organization sells, right? So really developing that business acumen, understanding the industry that you're selling into, understanding their customer, understanding the ICP, their ICP and everything like that is so important. So Zach, you are someone that I've always uh, admired in terms of cold outreach. So I'm really eager to learn a little bit um, about what you do in terms of cold emails and what you're looking uh, to throw into your cold emails. Yeah, I think first, Danny and Jack, like, both great. I, like, I, I'd echo the same thing. I think from like a framework perspective, relevancy, critical. But then on the other side, brevity. Like if you ask your executives, like, how do you communicate with each other? They're going to be three sentences long, right? And they're not going to be these huge paragraphs about whatever. They're going to be three sentences and that's what you should be communicating because you want to sound just like your buyer. You don't want to sound like a seller or a marketer going to your buyer. And then that's the other thing. Make it about them. I see so many marketing emails and also just emails from people who are just entering the sales development space that are all about, you know, I'm going to pick on sales work because I was at Salesforce as well. And I did this here. Sorry, Jack, no shame thrown at you at all. But oh, Salesforce can do that. Salesforce can do this. That doesn't matter. You need to figure out like what matters to the prospect and then make it about them. What do they get out of talking to you? What do they get about your solution? Now, what does your solution do for them? Slightly different way of framing that. Now yeah. you, you teed me up there about, and let me know if I'm going too far ahead, but, but what I like to include in it in cold outreach. This is the fun part. I'm like semi stalkerish, I feel like. And this goes to, I'm not trying to figure out like, oh, your favorite team is the Knicks. Like, I'm going to send you something about the Knicks. I don't think that's important. Now, some people do, 
that's a good way to break through the noise. But again, that's not going to be super relevant to the business case. What I think is cool is, and what I've loved using in the past and seeing a lot of success with is using podcasts and webinars. So if someone's trying to sell to Mamora and I was their ideal persona, hey, Zach, saw you on this webinar. You mentioned this about cold outreach. I'm using it on you. Do you have time to chat? Like I would find that valuable and I'd want to talk to that person because they took the time to listen to what I wanted to say. Everybody wants to feel like they're what they say is important and what they say is wisdom. So if you can build people's egos up like that, I think that's fantastic. And you can also get really great account insight from there. And then the two other ones, like I'm in healthcare. I'd say like big ones going to be laws and regulations. There's a huge thing for patient report outcomes uh, in the healthcare space, specifically for like orthopedics. And that targeted like a huge campaign where everybody was thinking about that in our space. So it was relevant. People were responding quickly. And it was something that was top of mind that everybody had to jump onto in a specific time frame. The other thing that I'd call out as well is conferences. Every single industry is, is littered with conferences. And you can find people who are very engaged and want to learn more by the people who want to go to these conferences. So if you go on LinkedIn and look up like health or vibe as a conference in, in healthcare, if you type in hashtag vibe 2024, you're going to see everybody who posted, I'm going to vibe this year. Who's going? And then you can start prospecting and targeting people that way. So it can really become a, a high hot list of people to target in those emails as well. Yeah. And a great way to scale personalization right there, right? Is bucketing your prospects and bucketing your accounts and finding like process prospects and like accounts with a similar message that is personalized to that, right? That's also a really tough part, but I think Zach just gave a perfect example of how you can do that. So what we, I want to jive J jump right into actually building the pitches. But before we do, I want to call out that I recently put out a, a blog on my frameworks that I use for cold outreach, as well as how I think about research and personalization and relevance. So if you want to take a look at that, go check it out on our website. But without further ado, let's jump right into it. So I am going to be sharing my screen here. So bear with me while I pull it up. And we are going to dive into some of the some of the pitches that were sent to us by some brave attendees, right? So we're going to dive into it. So let's let me just get this into full screen here. Perfect. But before we do, I want to share the framework that I've always used and how I break down my cold emails. So when I think about cold emails, which is not on here, I think brevity is really key, like Zach says. So anywhere between 50 to 75 words. I like to keep the subject line super short between one to three words. I also like to do all lowercase, right? Reason why I like to do all lowercase, pull up your email, check out every single subject line you're receiving. I guarantee you won't see any of them that are completely lowercase, right? So it's a, not, a nice way to differentiate yourself from uh, everyone else. And that subject line should explain what the email is about. Then for the actual email itself, I like to open up with a specific observation and why I'm reaching out. So the best cold emails, in my opinion, explain why you're reaching out. But if you want to get an A plus on your emails, you got to answer the question, why are you reaching out now? Why is it so important right now? Why has this become a priority right now? If you can answer that, you're definitely going to get the interest of your prospect. Then talking about the pain or the problem associated with why you're reaching out, how you can actually solve that pain point, how your solution can actually solve that pain point. I like to use uh, social proof here as well as case studies and then a soft CTA, something like open to learning more. I like how Jack just said actually flipping it into the negative, opposed to learning more. I really like that pattern interruptions are really important. And then I like to throw any sort of personalization that I find that's not relevant to my outreach in the PS section to show that prospect that this message is specifically for you. So it's going to be really interesting since we have folks from very different backgrounds and what they sell on how they go about their cold outreach. But I want to give you my framework that I've been using and how I've seen success in my career so far. But let's jump into the pitches to start start off with. So this one is from Bruce. 
I'm, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. I'm sorry. Bruce Kimura? Bruce, are you here? If you're open to it, we'd love to have you up on stage. If not, no worries. I'll give you a second. I have Anthony or God in the background helping me out, bring people in onto the stage. And if anything goes wrong, helping me out there too. Um, so Anthony will bring them on if you're willing to hop on. If not, that's totally fine. So let's jump into it. So this one is for a company called Valpac. So Bruce works at Valpac and he's targeting Mod Pizza with the persona of a director of marketing. His target prospect is Charlotte White. So she's the public, public relations director. And this is the actual email. I'm going to read it out loud um, really quickly. So Charlotte, I received a postcard from Mod about Factura Bellevue Washington store reopening a while back. Is that something you ever see? If so, can we chat to see how I can save Mod some real dollars? If not, can you direct me to the right person? And the subject line is Charlotte. A very quick question. All right. So let's jump off into a little bit of feedback first, and then we are going to break this pitch apart and then rewrite it. So anyone want to jump in with a little bit of feedback from the panel here? I can go first. I think it's got great brevity of like similar to what Zach was saying. Like this is about the length of an email that like if you're going to email a CFO, right? Like you can't put anything else other than this for a quick because this seems to be like a yes, no question. Hey, are you in charge of this? And can I talk to you about it? And I do think that the, hey, are you in charge of this type thing is always a good, soft call to action, right? It's not like you're saying like, hey, I know that you're in charge of this thing. And then if they're not, you lose credibility. If you do, that's great. But if this is also like a new logo and you haven't really talked to them before, this is a good like fact finding email. But it's also a little bit hard to know. I don't know that what Valpac does off of just this email. I'm sure if I'm a really interested public relations director, I could go Google it and be like, God, oh, does this make sense or not? But you also want to lead your prospect to water of they don't, you should make it as easy as possible for them to understand what you're doing and saving real dollars. I'm totally interested in that. I think most businesses would be. Don't know how they would do that off of sending me a postcard or things like that. Those are my thoughts. Love it. Yeah. yeah. And Danny, you go pop on in. Yeah. I echo a lot of the same sentiment. There was like, I loved the personalization aspect that great job there, like receiving a postcard, being able to do that. But the same thing could have done. I looked up Valpac to understand a little bit more as we're like doing this. And we could have put, positioned a question too. Did you get the ROI on these postcards that you were anticipating? If not, would love to chat with you more about how we might be able to increase that ROI and save you money. So just putting it back again, showing your value, that piece. And I think to this one specifically, the subject line, a very quick question. I think sometimes we see that a lot. And so that's where I think they're like received your postcard from mod, just anything, something like that was a little bit more personalized might've gotten Charlotte's even click to open the email as well. But when looking at it, that was like, and I think like leading with that pain that you talked about, and then also what's the value here to know right away, but did like the soft CTA to figure out if it's the right person, just like a little bit of like questions back to back. So like breaking that out just a little bit more. Yeah. Three questions in a row. I think Jack just said this, and then we're going to hop into Zach's feedback. But you want to make it as easy as possible for the prospect to one, understand what your value is and what you're really selling and why they should buy it. But then also so easy for them to respond. Asking three questions makes it really difficult for the prospect to respond. Zach, I know you're all about brevity, so I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on this brief email. I like it. There's some parts that I think can do some like to it off and some refinement. But when I read this, it looks like I got a text message. And I love emailing people who send me text messages via email. Like that's how I can. So I'm all about that. I think Danny, like spot on about this subject line. I wouldn't open this if I saw a very quick question because I know right away that's the sales. No, no one's ever asked me to turn it. Is that a very quick question? If it is, they'll slack. So you need to understand like the different communication channels they have internally. And to your point, like maybe it's 
I love Marcus Anderson. April, uh, April Coast Card Campaign ROI question mark. That, that's very targeted to what they said. Hey, Charlotte, love Mod Pizza. In fact, I received a postcard back in February for April. Is this something you oversee? And then again, Jack, to your point, like, how are they going to save money? I, I think right there, you have the, the structure of a great email here, but just need a little bit of tune up to make sure that they truly understand the how and the why that they're going to see these uh, dollar savings. Yep. Like, you put a photo of you with the postcard, right? Yeah. Or can you get a selfie of, there's this random sales guy that's just holding up my postcard that emailed me, right? If you had put this email with that photo, that also probably they'd be like, okay, I guess I'll respond because they like, took the time to do that, even if you don't change any of the text. But that's also something where like, think about the last time you got an email that someone put a photo of themselves with the thing you sent. That's another huge pattern interrupt and would maybe even confuse them enough to want to then reach out to you. Exactly. I think it's, that's very cre a creative way to go about outreach and a way to differentiate yourself, right? Yeah. I think when I think about this email, I agree with all of you, right? I think the length is great. I think the brevity is great. It's easy to read. I, I think her observation, uh, his observation to begin with is really good, right? It's a great trigger to reach out and why you're reaching out. But in terms of what I think this could be improved on is it really doesn't answer the question of like, how can Valpac actually help mod save some real dollars, right? And I think if you're going to say, make a claim like that, you've got to have some kind of explanation as to how you're going to do it. Because you can't just assume that the prospect knows what your company does, right? So let's talk about if you were Bruce, and you were writing this email, how would you go about writing this email? Where would you start? Who wants to start off? Where would you start? Where's the first place you start when you write an email? Subject line. Yes, yeah, I meant, I meant like for your research, from a research perspective. Uh, right? Probably their LinkedIn profile, right? How you found them, right? So let's pull up her LinkedIn, pull up Charlotte's LinkedIn, right? So when we pull this up, I'm gonna actually pull it up on both LinkedIn Sales Navigator, as well as on LinkedIn, so we can see the differences. So Danny, I want you to explain where you look for on LinkedIn, because you brought up some interesting, interesting ways for you to do research on someone's LinkedIn profile page. Where do you go to do some of that research that you were talking about? Yeah, so right there above where you can see where it says show all comments, this is going to be something that's really going to be the most impactful for somebody who's active on LinkedIn a lot, which I know in the next exercise we'll be able to use. I can't remember if it was Charlotte's or not. I think like a lot of her stuff was interacted a bit a while ago, but up at the very top, actually, if you don't mind scrolling back up, what you can do is you can look at posts and single out to just what have they posted recently? Because obviously if they're posting it or reposting something and adding to it, they care about it. But then you can also go and see what they commented on or what they reacted to. What this is really great is, so for instance, for me, like I'm in the like CTV space using like performance marketing and connected TV. And so did they click on something that has anything to do with TV advertising? Did they react to something that was maybe a thought leadership article? Now what I can do is take some resources that we have at Mountain and then tie those together. Hey, saw you were interested in this, thought this might be able to expand your, what you're researching right now. So I like to do that just because it, and then it also shows how active are they on LinkedIn? Is it worth using in-mail credits to reach out to them if they haven't really done much in the last six months? Probably not. It's not going to be a, a medium that you might get in front of them with. Perfect. And Danny, quick question. How, are you, how long are you spending when you're looking for this stuff? As we can tell, Charlotte's not very active on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. So would we spend the time going through this because really quickly, we would look at posts and she hasn't posted on LinkedIn in two years, right? Mm -hmm. So we look through the reactions and stuff like that. But how long are you going and looking through this stuff before you say, I'm going to move on to another resource that I'm going to go check out? It depends on how active they are. Like for her, I wouldn't spend more than 15 seconds. Like I would see that she last interacted with something or posted so long ago that the reality is even if I found something that I could bridge, she might not be interested in that anymore. But if it's somebody who's a little bit more active, like we'll see in the Next example, I might spend a minute and a half of my three minutes there because, again, if we can get that personalized piece, it's going to stick out a little bit more. 
that's where I'm going to spend my time versus maybe something I found on their website that's going to resonate with them better. Awesome. Awesome. Perfect. And I think this is a great point to bring out. When you think about personalization, really, you got to break it down into a few different layers, right? Personal to that specific prospect. And that's exactly what Danny is looking for with these reactions and these posts, right? Something related to that specific prospect. You can look on LinkedIn. You can see if they were mentioned in a recent article. Zach loves to use podcasts, for example, but something related to that specific prospect. Then you got to think company, something related to that specific company news, funding, 10Ks, anything like that, that you can use to make so personalized to that specific company. And the last way to personalize is industry. So as you can tell, they go deeper and deeper the further down you get to being personal. But industry, Zach uses this a lot being in healthcare and life sciences, right? Industry regulations, right? Laws and regulations being changed. Any kind of industry news, competitors joining the industry, so on and so forth, right? A great way to just wanted to call that out. So there's a few different places you can actually go and look for information, but that's how I'd be thinking about personalization. Zach, how about you? Where, where do you go and start off? What is one resource that you would like to show everyone that you go and look at for specific prospects? I want to shout out Tate in the chat here because he shared exactly what I was going to say. Especially with it being mod pizza, when you think of the type of account that is, they're going to have a whole bunch of different news presences for stores reopening and everything like that. So I'd probably just go to Google, type in Mod Pizza and the geography that's at, and then type in and hit the news button. See if anything pops up in the recent past. Click on the more there. Yeah, right there, buddy. Now you can see all this stuff to start popping up. And now you can even get more specific if you type in where, like, the specific Mod Pizza they want to reach out to. I don't know if that has a specific, that had a specific area. I'll you, but yeah. Yeah. Looks like Mod Pizza isn't doing too hot. In that area, shutting down 26 restaurants. So maybe you want to tailor your pitch to how they can save money and create operational efficiency. But all this new. Hey, you exactly. just brought up the point. She, they, they said save real dollars. Like maybe they need to save real dollars. How can we tie in that recent news to saving real dollars? I love that. Perfect. Any, anything else, Zach? Sorry for interrupting you. No. I, I like jamming with you. I miss doing it, Sean. Um, <laughs> uh, I think this is probably. I don't want to step on anybody else's shoes, but news, LinkedIn Navigator, the press. I, I find myself like, I work with quite a few public companies, so 10Ks are great, but they're also just a mess to dig through. I would probably say Google the person's name. I over, I over leverage Google. I'm pretty simple in that mind because Google does everything for me. But like you can Google Shark White Mod oh. Pizza and see if something pops up. I, I I doubt something pops up in this space. But this is something I pull out directly. So then you can get to that level that Danny was mentioning about the very specific personalization that comes up on that. And you can see, have they been posting anything? If they're a PR person, they might be in the news. They might have shared an article with the circuit or anything of that nature. Awesome. Awesome. And. Just want to show you a quick little plug here for Lead IQ, right? Lead IQ can pull all of those resources without going into Google directly from our platform. So you can actually, we can only see one right here. So it's not really a good one, but company news. So it pulls in company news, podcast, 10Ks, all of that stuff directly into your workflow. So you never have to leave that specific workflow, which is pretty awesome. That wasn't a great example there, but... We'll show you some more examples of how we can do that too. Jack, how about you? Where is a place you go look for personalization or doing your research when it comes down to prospects? Yeah, I think a lot of people said all the main things that I start out with. I think that one of the things that can sometimes be helpful as well is if you go look them up on YouTube or Instagram, especially if you've got like a big like logo, like Mod Pizza, like they probably have all their news and stuff on Instagram where you can see, oh, are they rolling out something new? Do they have a new like marketing campaign they're running or things like that? But with Zach's end of just like Googling people, I think really honestly will populate more things than you realize. If you just Google like my name, then this like podcast might pop up, this webinar might pop up, and then someone could watch me do this live and then be like, hey, saw you did that live. Looks like you need help with whatever. Here's how I can help. 
I think that as long as you put in a little bit of time to learn as much as you can, then you just have to keep moving on to the next one too. Because I think similar to what Danny said, Charlotte's not really on LinkedIn. I hope she's not in here right now as we're flaming her LinkedIn presence that she's not doing enough. But like there are people out there that are super on LinkedIn and are you know, probably a better person to reach out to to try to drive a conversation. Because you may, Charlotte may be the end decision maker you need, but you may not know enough to even want to talk to Charlotte yet. So trying to find other people that'll like, it'll say like other similar profiles or other people that are related to this person or even some of their connections. And you can try to dig through that. But everything that Zach and Danny said, I think is also spot on. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so those are all great ways to do research. And I'll share one of my favorite new ways that I've been able to do research. And that's through LinkedIn Sales Navigator, right? So Mod, we'll pull up Mod Pizza. I really love this I, account IQ, right? So when I think about cold outreach, this is everything that I think about when I'm doing cold outreach. Who are they? How do they make money, right? What are their strategic priorities, right? What do they care about? What are their business challenges? Who are their competitors? What is happening with, in terms of growth or reduction in employee size? So th those are all things for me in terms of how I'm thinking about how to position my messaging. So for example, we were talking about Valpac, right? Community engagement. Valpac sends actual like coupons out to the community, to the to customers. So they're trying to get mod, mod pizza to use Valpac to send out uh, coupons. So as you can tell, one of their strategic priorities is community engagement. So tying in that they want to be involved in the community with sending out coupons could be a really great way to tie in a strategic initiative or priority. So as we can tell, we didn't find anything really like to hit that personal note for Charlotte, right? So we got to go to company and then to industry, right? So this is a great way to get a summary of everything and how I think about cold outreach as well. So let's dive into the next one, right? Because I think the next one is a, a little bit better of an example of how we think about personalization, right? So I'm going to jump into the next one here. So this is from Kristen Silvestri. Kristen, are you here from Oracle? If you are here, we'd love to have you up on stage to talk through your pitch. If not, no worries. We're going to dive right into it. But I'll start off by reading this. So subject line, accelerate strategy, faster close. Dear Kofi, I've been following General Mills' strong Q3 results and the recent progress against your accelerate, accelerate strategy. Your strategic initiatives, including substantial investments in digital technology, are particularly noteworthy. As General Mills continues to execute its accelerate strategy and given you are a current Hyperion financial management customer of ours, there's an opportunity for us to collaborate. I have perspectives to share on how we've helped Kraft Heinz, the wonderful company, and Dairy Gold modernize manual and time-consuming consolidation, consolidations into an automated and integrated close. Does that resonate with you? All right. So this is, once again, Oracle. Target account is General Mills. Target persona is CFO. Target prospect is Kofi. So let's go through a little bit of feedback for Kristen here. I'll jump in first. Oh, wait. No, Kristen is joining. Never mind. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thanks for having me. So, Kristen, I was, we were talking about this, right? And we're looking at, obviously, Oracle sells a, a ton of stuff, right? When I think about Oracle or Salesforce. So, obvious, what I'm thinking, this is for PeopleSoft. Am I wrong? Is this for PeopleSoft? Is this email outreach for PeopleSoft specifically? It's not. It's actually for our EPM cloud, which is for finance and accounting. It's the cloud version of Hyperion, which they're currently using. Okay, perfect. So that gives us a little bit of context. So let's dive into a little bit of feedback. I actually really love this email, by the way, Kristen. But who wants to start off with a little bit of feedback? I'll start off for some feedback. And Kristen, as Sean said, great foundation of an email here. Your level of education has to be like 10 times higher than me, though. Particularly noteworthy. I don't think I've ever said that phrase in, in a sentence or an opportunity for us to collaborate. And so 
and I, I'm coming in slightly harsh. It, it's great email, but I think about like you're writing to a human. I, I would like if you've heard my other comments earlier, it's make it sound like a text, make it very short, make it brief. And it might not be your style as well. I'm all for authenticity. So if this is you, let this be you and let it shine. I, I just right away and say, I, I see this. I would, what I'd want here is combine the first and the second sentence and go a layer deeper. What I see here, like you are at the surface of a great email. And if you call out one thing about their accelerate program, about the strategic conditions, what about digital technology are they investing? Can you call out one specific in that? And I think you really break through the noise with that. Subject line, great. Understand, or I, I, I love that. And then the last thing as well, like you have perspective on how you've helped. Give them a little bit of a nugget. I, I like, uh, like right there, it's just like, I already know you're keeping me to try and get a conversation. I always try to think, share a little bit more value and they're going to want to uh, engage with you. So if you're always giving to people, they're going to give back to you, whether that's their time, whatever it is. So I, I would give them a little bit more here, whether it's a white paper, a stat or something like that, just to get them a little bit more interested. But right away, like great email all around. I'll add one piece on top of that. Kristen, you and I are similar coming from big, big software companies, Oracle and Salesforce can swing their weight around a little bit. And whether or not General Mills is already an Oracle customer or not, I do, because I have a lot of current customers that I work with, I like to put a lot of the relevance of like why I'm reaching out to you. We've talked to these four names, or we've talked to these three, or when I was a BDR and I was working with a lot of healthcare companies, I would even throw around how much they spend with us to be like, you guys spend seven figures with us. I'm reaching out because we think we can get you better ROI on this, that, and the other thing. And the other thing that I do because Salesforce can swing its radar way around is like my subject line is sometimes I will put in the subject line, Oracle medium request around blank, right? That's a CFO will get that email and be like, okay, I know exactly what they're asking me about. Let me open it to see if there's something that makes sense for why I should take this meeting because this CFO is probably getting 700 emails a day. And so you're trying to make it like if they're reading it on their phone, what are the first like, five lines that they see? Because it's great that you saw their Q3 results. That's awesome. But he probably has, he searches those words in his email. He's probably got like 200 of those. We think that doing stuff like that to simplify up front. And then once you get them in the email, you can add exactly what's back said. Here's why. And here's the little value add that we think we can deliver for you. Definitely echo a lot of what's been said a lot of good nuggets here. It's just refining some of it. What we just showed on LinkedIn, Kofi was an example of somebody who I went and looked at. And if you go and look at recent posts, you'll actually see it was about a week or a week and a half ago. There was a post that he had done where he was announcing that he joined the board of Feeding America, who is has a partnership with General Mills. And so again, understanding he's a CFO, he's probably getting a lot of emails, things of that nature. I, like see how quick that was to load. That's just something else that you could have added that first sentence of your email because it shows that you you did a little bit more than just sent him a targeted email around what you, the company is. Again, people like to see what you know about them. And that was something that I thought was pretty neat when I found it right away that could have been added at the beginning of that email as well. Also, like adding on top of that, when Sean, you don't have to engage with the LinkedIn. I'd go right on and I'd click like on that LinkedIn post right away. I'd be like, hey, mf -er. I just emailed you and you're going to see me on LinkedIn too. Yeah, I, I will be here. So better respond to me in one way or the other. Yeah, and Kofi, if you're listening, please respond. Just be one of those prospects that does respond. But I think, really, Kristen, like when I look at this email, I think it has everything it needs to have in order to be a well-written email, right? Like when you think about it, you're talking about I'm pretty sure this Accelerate strategy, they just recently re released a news article that they're progressing towards that. That's where you got it from, right? They're progressing towards that Accelerate strategy. So I can tell you've done your research and you can, you've shown that you've done your research, but I think you're getting lost in the sauce a little bit with trying to, you're selling to a technical persona. So you're trying to sound technical and overly smart. But when you think about it, 
being as simple as possible. I'm an executive. I'm running around. I'm Kofi running around, right? All I have is my phone on here. I want to be able to read that message quick and get to it and read it as fast as possible and understand it quickly in order to respond fast. So when we think about it, these people are really busy, right? So we could shorten this up a little bit is my only feedback. And I loved what Jack said. You have a huge, warm way to get into this account and with this prospect by them already being a customer. Call that out right away. That's a gold mine, right? Like, hey, you're already working with, we're already working with your colleagues. Just mentioning that right there, you'll see your response rates will skyrocket. And having worked at Salesforce as well, being able to reference that many customers all the time, I really do believe that's why I was, one of the reasons why I was successful at Salesforce is being able to use those customer references and be able to talk through some of those stories. I think we could have talked through a little bit more about why some of those pro those and why are those consolidations manual and time consuming? What are they spending their time on? Dive into a little bit more of that pain. Make Kofi feel that, right? I think he's got to feel like I'm spending way too much time doing this stuff. There's a faster way to do it and I can save X amount of dollars. That's what you got to be. He's wanted, wanting to be thinking in his head. But like I said, everything here, like I love that you use social proof. Like those are great logos to be saying to General Mills, right? Like, awesome way to earn credibility right there. I loved your research talking about how they're investing in digital technology, talking about their accelerate strategy. So you had everything. And this is, the pro this is one of the things that like having worked at Salesforce and working at a smaller company, you start to realize like you, you we've got to dumb it down. I try to make everything I write, like a fifth grader could read this. You know, if a fifth grader can't read this, I'm not sending it out, right? But really great job in terms of, finding this information because I think for this prospect, they're going to be like, she knows what she's talking about. Yeah, I I really it. thank you. Oh, Sean, one thing that you said, I actually have this in my notes, but I think one of the things I like to do sometimes in, instead of like a soft CTA is when I call, force them to dream. And so even putting, like, if we could save you even five hours a week on manual work, how could that time be spent differently? Just leaving that for them to then think about. And it creates maybe this category of pain that they didn't realize that they had there. It's true. Impact is relating that, the impact of the pain. Zach, sorry for interrupting. No, I was just going to say that's a really good call out. And the last thing I'd say, we talked a lot about email content. I think one thing that's important as well is that Kofi, they're probably going to respond to you or they're looking at their email if they're looking at it at 8 p.m. at night over a glass of scotch or at their kid's basketball practice or something of that nature. So again, like how do you stand out? And also the timing of the email is going to be important when you're reaching out to the C-level as well. If you send it to them at nine in the morning, that's going to be at the bottom of their email and they're just going to be in the mode to tell things uh, when they get to it. So you want to make sure that you're sending out at the right time for the right individuals, depending on who your persona is. But again, awesome job. Awesome. I got, I like one, other, I got one other tactical thing. Yes. Right. Chris, that's awesome that you're standing up here and, and taking all this feedback. So thanks for doing that. When you send an email like this, obviously, like they might not get you on the first one, right? But if you keep following on the same chain, and you can, like you like, see your name, like Kristen seven in parentheses, this is the seventh time you followed up with like additional value every time is one thing that Sean taught me early on is keep giving them value. You don't have to put everything in the original email, but I like to also give a little bit of an out sometimes, right? Even though Zach is roasting me that Oracle's better than Salesforce. We'll take that one offline and disagree. But if you, give them, if you give them an out, right, to be like, hey, also didn't know if the VP of finance would be the right person. Let me know if you're not the right person to reach out to about this when you're on like four or five. And so I think that sometimes can help just get some sort of engagement back from you. And they might send you over to the right person that's actually in charge of this thing. Yeah, I think, I think that's where it comes down for the CTA is what is your ask? And I think at the end of the day, when you think about cold email, like the best thing is obviously to get the yes and get meeting set. But like at the end of the day, getting a response, especially nowadays, 
is killer. So you want to make it as easy as possible for them to respond. And something like that, that Jack mentioned, it takes the pressure off. Like, you don't have to meet with me. Just give me a little bit of something so I can go prospect someone else. But great job, Chris. I really think you obviously know what you're talking about and know the industry you're selling to, and you know where to find really good information. So great job. Thank you so much. Of course. So I saw here that we've got a couple questions and I have been, I apologize, I've been totally ignoring these. So I want to dive into some of these. So when name dropping customers, is it okay if it isn't the same industry as who you're like, who they're in, right? So like when you're referencing customers, should they be at, in the same industry? So interesting point there. I would love to get your guys's input into that. I have a strong opinion here, but would love to hear your input. Danny, why don't you start off with, I see you nodding. Yeah. Ideally, you always want to name drop a customer in their industry because it almost leads with that FOMO aspect. And especially if you're currently like obviously working with those clients. But the reality is what you if you don't have the opportunity to do that, you want to find something that's like similar size, maybe similar conversion point or metric or something like that, that you can really tie back to not just the logo, but what you've done to help with that organization accomplish. But my go would always be if you can get in the same industry that is going to resonate better than others. Totally agree. Yeah. And when I think about dropping the name of customers, right? The first thing I do, honestly, when I'm prospecting and looking into an account is I search account like Mod Pizza competitors. Then I go see if we are working with any of their competitors. If we're working with any of their competitors, you want to name drop that right away, right? Because that's FOMO, like Danny's saying, right? Because if they're using you guys, we want to use you guys too, because they're doing pretty well. So we want to emulate what they're doing, right? So using like customers, I think is going to be the best bet when it comes down to that. So let's talk about a little bit more about research for this specific email. We didn't really dive into like how we would rewrite it. So I would love to get, is there anything that you guys would think that we would want to research more for this email or we think we did a pretty good job and Kristen did a pretty good job. I think she did great. So let's move on to the next one, right? So here we go. So this is from Catherine Cook. Catherine, if you're here, join us on stage. We've got 11 minutes left, so we are going to fly through this one. So please join us if, you're, if you want to. Totally up to you. But the company is Gapify. Target account is Tarsus Pharmaceuticals. The persona is Controller. Target prospect is Greg Rivera. So subject line, automate and audit proof Tarsus accruals. Hi, Greg. Not sure if this is the, if the, not sure if this is the case for you, but life sciences, life science companies often report complex accruals processes bogged down by industry regulations. Given that, wanted to put Gapify on your, on your radar. IOVANCE and at AI Life Sciences use Gapify accrual cloud to automate their entire expense accruals process, integrating into their existing tech stack to shorten close times and gain a more complete and accurate picture of their expenses. Interested in learning how? So Catherine's here. Why don't we bring Catherine on stage? Or we'll just have her do any Q&A, but let's break down this cold email. Who wants to start off? I can go first. I like it. It's good. I think it's got two pretty specific what would be maybe similar to Tarsus after walk up to the stage. And I think that they, they, seem, they seem like really relevant, like probably similar companies and like opening with a little bit of the reverse, like not sure if this is right. I always liked, especially if I'm like, this isn't like a cold calling webinar, but I always like to be like, I don't know if I'm in the right place. I don't know if this is the right person to be talking to. I don't know if this is the right thing that you're dealing with, but this is what I'm hearing. Is that right? And it makes you sound a lot more friendly than you're like, you're immediately going to your pitch. You're like leading with, I've heard this is true. Can you confirm? Is that right? And I also think that you do a really good job of the one liner saying that we automate their entire expense accruals process, integrating into their existing tech stack, short and close times and gain a more complete and accurate picture of their expenses. 
which I'm sure this controller probably is thinking about that all the time. And this is probably something that is pretty relevant. And I think it's good that you're like going after the controller. If this was like something like a marketing director, we'd be like, this is probably the wrong person that like, you're reaching out to. Uh, but I think this is very strong. Welcome, Catherine. Great email, by the way, as you can tell from our panelists, right? Awesome job. From this email, I could tell exactly what you guys did. And that's not the case from for most emails. So I think it's really solid too, but let's get the rest of the pan panelists feedback. Zach, how about you? Any feedback you got? I'm trying to come up with something super critical, but Catherine, I don't know if I've got it too much for you. This is, I love the not sure if this is the case right away. There's when I first was making cold calls, one of the th tactics I used was I would actually start my phone call saying sorry instead of saying hi because it just catches someone off guard and it changes their emotional charge as they read the rest of this email. So, not sure if this is this, it already makes it a lot more conversational of an email in the ask is going to be that big. So, like, you make it easy for someone to respond to or want to or engage right away at the top. I think like the one thing that I would call out here, one, put Gapify on your radar. I, I like the conversational tone of that, but I would just say, hey, I would give a little, put like a little bit more emphasis on a Iovance biothera Biotherapeutics and an ATAI. I hope I say that right. I, I would just lean right into that. I would cut that out because the given that one, put this on it. That's fluff and that's making this email longer than it has to be. And I'm just like, the big thing that my eyes just focus on is that second paragraph could cut, be cut in half in some way. And I think that's where you would really like milk this to its final form is just making it a little bit more condensed. Other than that, great. Awesome. Jenny? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll right. add, I think something we probably could have prefaced at the beginning is the reality is be authentically you. So some of the feedback, like if it doesn't resonate with you, don't try to force yourself to be somebody you're not. So take some of these nuggets, like you're going to hear a lot from me always about the personal aspect of it. I like to connect with people on a very personal level. So I just want to say that not, it's not one size fits all. It's like taking these nuggets and like making it your own. This is an incredible email. I would just say two things. Greg, he is a board member for Junior Achievement. It might just be something I'm passionate about. I've volunteered with Junior Achievement before, but he's like going in and helping basically raise up the next generation. So again, that could just be, that was just me scrolling all the way to the bottom, seeing what he had in his volunteer history or experience. But what I would say is, I know we're talking about how having those two companies in there fluff it a little. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, but I think if you're going to have that there, how much time did these companies that are using Gapify save and how did, like, what did you give them back? I think that could have really hit home a little bit more of okay, what was the actual incremental time they got back or whatever that value add was back into their process? Or maybe it was things were incomplete and they had an 80% completion and now it's 100%. But what's that statistic that you could pull out that really shows what you've done to help um, level them up? Apart from that, I liked the soft close at the end. I think sometimes, and again, this is like nitpicky, but you can like position it too in a partnership aspect. Hey, I would be curious to learn how your process is going what you've been running into and then interested in sharing like what we've seen and, and done over here. But yeah, other, it was a great email. Like, again, that's pretty nitpicky, but great job. Awesome. Awesome. Thank wanted, you, Danny. Wanted to jump back in there. One thing, like two, two things to call out. I don't like hi. I think that or like right away, I can tell that's a cold email, but again, like, to each their own here, I, Danny, like your point on authenticity and be yourself. I want to be like who I am or my job. You can ask Sean or Jack who's worked with me. Authenticity is the biggest thing. Uh, total true. So like just saying Greg, like I like cut out the high to say Greg or even uh, I say, hey, uh, and I think I'm a little bit more informal on that end. And some people probably don't like it in my industry. I have to call people doctor. So like really making sure that you are meeting the right level of formality and danny what you just said i think was uh, really spot on is again like there's a reason why i said yes to this to joining this webinar i like talking about things and i like thinking i'm good at it. and so if you can get someone to feel that way via email it's like hey i know 
that you're really good at this, would love to understand your process behind this. I think what Danny offered there is advice, it's great advice, because who doesn't want to talk about something that they might see in it, some value out of that conversation, and they're going to teach you something. They're going to love being that individual. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll just jump in last here, Catherine. I think this email is great, right? There's one thing that I would fix with this is exactly what Zach said. When you look at that second paragraph, it's just too much for the eyes. When we think about how we read in general, we read in like an F style format. So try to make your emails in that F style format with plenty of white space, right? So Long sentences typically decrease reply rates. So if we could cut up this sentence and maybe make it into two instead of a long uh, run-on sentence, I think it would look really nice. And then breaking it up into two different paragraphs, I think would make a huge difference, right? Because if I'm someone, I want something that's really easy to read. If it's not really easy to read, forget about it. I'm swiping to the next thing I get. Danny, how many prospecting emails do you think you get a day at being an SDR lead? Oh. I don't know, too many to count. How many do you read? Yeah. If the subject line doesn't grab my attention, I most of the time, unless I'm trying to study somebody's touch pattern to understand what they're doing and what their threaded emails look like. But that's yep. just depending on if I'm doing like research study for myself versus if I was actually captivated by what they said. 100%. So that's why you can see how important the subject line is. I get hundreds of prospecting emails a week, right? I would, that's the next big feedback right there. That's why I asked Danny, right? If she doesn't see this, if she doesn't, if she reads the subject line and it's not something that's engaging, right? She's not going to open it or something that's interesting. So I would honestly just be very simple with this. I'm a big fan of one word subject lines, one to three word subject lines. So just accruals. That's it. All lowercase. If you look at someone, go to your email inbox, take a look and see if you see any lowercase subject lines, see if you see any one word subject lines, I guarantee you will separate yourself from everyone else in their inbox. But other than that, I think you did a really good job. I understood what you guys told. I think you talked about, you made them feel like, okay, I'm not alone, right? People in this industry are experiencing this too. So it's okay that I'm experiencing it. If you wanted to go a layer deeper, I did some, do some digging on perplexity. I think that's how you say it. And if you just search like their actual renewals, if there's any challenges around their renewals process in here, I wish I had my last, let's see if I can find my history. Really quick. No, I can't find it really quick. But if you search like challenges around their accounting accruals process because they're a publicly traded company, there's going to be a ton that pulls up there. And if you can call out specific challenges that may be facing with their accruals process, I think that would be good as well. But other than that, great job. This is a great resource too to do some digging. Jacob showed me this from our marketing uh, department and it's a really great resource. But thank you so much, Catherine. I appreciate it. We've got 34 seconds thank left. You. Of course, thank you for being brave and coming up on the stage. Let's hope uh, that warrants a response too. And thank you so much to our panelists for joining here today. Really enjoyed spending the last hour with you all. Clearly, these are experts at prospecting. If you are someone that is prospecting, add these folks on LinkedIn, go blow them up, pick their brain, right? I'm just kidding. Don't blow them up, but pitch their brain. But thank you again. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Cheers. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Thank you.